I will give you a break from category theory because I hardly mention category theory at all. So uh, you might wonder why I dare to speak here. Uh, but I understood that one of the uh, points of the conference was to find new ap possible applications of category theory. So some applications are already, as we see, quite obvious. Uh, application in physics, mathematics, maybe in philosophy, which is less clear, but we'll hear more about that. So my uh, aim is to just consider possible new applications in the context of epistemic and poetic processes. Uh, what is the meaning of those terms? I'll, of course, try to explain. So the poetic and epistemic processes are kinds of creative activity. This, this classification or the name comes from Aristotle, in fact, who uh, divided activity into three kinds. Uh, that's uh, epistemic, poetic, and also praxis was, was doing. I won't go into details because that, that's not important, but the names are quite practical, so I use them. So I am uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to find out whether category theory could, can be somehow helpful in, in this context and consider this creative activity that is independent of any area or objects of activity. This is important. I, uh, I'll try to explain that a bit more. So I'll concentrate on what and why, but not on how. I leave this as an open question. So this is the staging of, of, of the talk. Uh, well, this is the universe. Well, it's not, not only the Earth, but the universe, let's say. And the A stands for artifacts. And here we have two kinds of processes. Epistemic process is the creation of knowledge about natural things and artifacts. Anything that is somehow embedded here. And poetic processes are are processes that aim at creation of artifacts of any kind, whatever kind you can say, technological, societal, economic, cultural, or whatever. Hmm? So, and what you see also here that those arrows, broken arrows, show that they are somehow dependent. Hmm? And you might imagine also that uh, this wheel turns. Then we have the third kind of activity that Aristotle defined, that is the praxis. And what follows also from that, that somehow they're not independent, those kinds of activities, though uh, usually they are so treated. So now, what, what, was, what is the broader context of uh, considering this kind of staging or situation? Well, well at least in my, uh, uh, my, let's say, broader uh, considerations, it is a possible way of trying to find a new viewpoint on one of the big problems we have in our societies, uh, contemporary. That is bigger and bigger specialization. Uh, we tend to specialize in analyzing narrower and narrower fields of objects. And this it is, it is well known that we have troubles in understanding each other. And it seems that there, when we look at this kind of problem, which was defined by C.P. Snow the end of, uh, uh, end of the 50s by the name of The Two Cultures, that was a very famous book which was very much discussed. And he pointed out that uh, we, we have a problem. He talked about two cultures. Now we have many cultures, in fact, much, much more. And the number of cultures that so are growing. And it seems that there is no much thing we can do about it if we stick to this classification of the areas of, of our expertise, uh, if we look at uh, through different kinds of objects we deal with. We have different objects in physics, different objects in biology, different objects in, say, humanities, and so on. So it seems that there's nothing to do with that. So what I'm trying to do is to find another way that is, so to say, orthogonal to the split, splitting through objects. So the orthogonal view is the view through the way we create things. 
or we deal with creation. We all create things. Hmm? One way or another. So, now, with this context, we have, in fact, some deep philosophical questions here. First of all, is there is a clear demarcation between natural things and artifacts? Is, is this feasible? There's a big literature about that. It seems hopeless now, especially with uh, what, things that happen in biology, for example, uh, of manipulative of genes and so on. Another question, is any cognizance an epistemic process? Which is not clear. It's, it's also, I think, a deep philosophical question. Is all knowledge an artifact? But these are just examples of questions we can ask in this uh, great context, but there are also other problems which I'll try to explain in, in short. Well, let's look first at the very simplified and very usual conceptualization of the epistemic and the poetic processes. We have a, some uh, epistemic process. We have some kind of description of, of well, this universe with the, all the artifacts. And in, uh, so it's the description of, of what is, as I call it, of what we somehow deal with. In the poetic processes, we have a description of, of what is to be, what is to be created. Uh, we, we could call this a prescription. It's a kind of de design or a recipe which uh, will, we hope will result in creating something. Any kind of artifact, technological, whatever. So. What? Oh, we did something wrong. Okay. Now, with this kind of very simple uh, conceptualization, I think uh, category theory will not, will, cannot be very helpful. Well, of course, it can help in understanding or formatting or structuring the descriptions here, okay? But it's hardly uh, conceivable that it can somehow help us to understand or interpret the, the miracle that happens in the transformation between the description of, of, of in, between what is described and, and how it is described, or how it is described and how it is, appears in reality. This is some kind of miracle because what happens here is a transformation of ontological categories. It is a kind of a miracle. We don't understand quite well how these things happen. We just do it. But so if we look at this kind of simplified picture, I don't think we can go much further. So let's try to have a less simplified conceptualization. Let's start with the epistemic process. So here we have the description of what is, and with a bit uh, uh, less simplified uh, case, we can, have, we can conceptualize it like, like this. So in this, uh, we have two kinds of descriptions, in fact. One is the description of hypothetical objects. I call it, it's kind of an objects I call H objects. But we also have a different description, which is uh, empirical objects. We, we have a description of what, of what we perceive in one sense. The perception will be, of course, we can, it can be a sensual perception, but also with a you know, hadron, hadron collider, whatever you wish. So anyway, this is a description of what we see somehow, well, how we perceive maybe with very fancy, uh, fancy technology and so on. And here, this arrow is especially important. What, what we do when we have this kind of two descriptions, then we somehow evaluate the hypothetical objects versus the empirical objects. And we want some kind of conformance here. And here is, where, here is the, the place where I hope uh, that a category theory can come in. So it can be useful in structuring the two descriptions with objects, kinds, morphemes, kinds, types, and so on. Establishing cr criteria of the evaluation, of the conformance evaluation between the two descriptions of hypothetical objects and empirical objects with functional, natural transformations, whatever, over machinery of, uh, of uh, category theory. 
and possibly uh, might be helpful in establishing meta theories that encompass the two kinds of descriptions. Hmm? Now, if you uh, now look at the poetic process, then again we try to transform the simplistic description with a more fancy one. So we, uh, again, we have two kinds of descriptions: descriptions of prescribed objects. The, uh, and well, this is the recipe somehow, or the, the way we, uh, we uh, formulate our design. And again, uh, when uh, something is uh, created upon this kind of description, well, we, we have to know what we have created, in fact. So we also have some kind of empirical description. And again, we have the problem expressed with this arrow. But this time, of course, we don't evaluate the, the qu somehow qu quality of the prescribed object, description of the prescribed object, but, <laughs> but the description of the empiric empirical objects, in fact, because this is what we see, how we perceive what was created. So we evaluate this versus this. This is, the arrow is, is uh, has the opposite direction compared with this one. Okay. So, again, if the two descriptions are somehow formalized, then the category theory, theory may be useful. As in the case of uh, as in the case of the epistemic process, but with the difference of the direction of evaluation, which, which implies a completely new, new kind of problems. Hmm? But this positive attitude to this uh, uh, CT uh, is, is well grounded on the condition that the descriptions I have been talking about can be formalized. So the question now is, how realistic is it to assume that the descriptions of the, the three types of objects can be formalized. So this is, this is the question that could lead us to understand where could be the real place uh, of category theory in, in this kind of problems. Well, consider the poetic processes. I mean, processes that lead to creation of something. I don't know, anything. Social system, chair, any kind of piece of technology, in the internet or whatever. Well, so we deal with prescriptions, of pre descriptions of prescribed objects. But there are several ar aspects or features of the prescribed designed objects that we have to take account. What kind of aspects or features? Like functions, physical form, application, effectiveness, dependability, aesthetics, whatever you name. So, sorry again, this button. There is, if you think about it, even if you consider uh, doing something very simple like desi designing and then creating a chair, it, it comes quite clear there is no one language, there is no universal language with, could, with which we could express all the features. Like functions and aesthetics, for example, clearly. Or dependability, whatever you want, applications and so on. They're, they're completely different languages. Hmm? This is, of course, a very important constraint in, in using uh, uh, CT uh, in practical cases. In real-world applications, when we deal with really complex systems that have many, many real aspects. This we have to take into account. So, this, considering this, we become less optimistic of the usefulness of category theory. Now let's see what, what, are the, uh, 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 what are the implications in case of epistemic and poetic processes. What is the difference of the problem in case of... I, I, I first uh, talked about this uh, poetic process, which was quite clear. You know? So do we have the same kind of problem in case of epistemic processes? Maybe in case of epistemic processes, it's, we, we, we don't have to be that pessimistic. Yeah? Yeah? Because why? Because in, ep in the epistemic processes, like, like the ones uh, we deal with in physics, for example, which we, there was much uh, talk about uh, uh, this kind of problems here, 
we just choose some kind of aspects we want to describe. We are usually not that ambitious to describe all possible aspects of the things we are describing, of which we describe with any kind of theory, uh, what, uh, what, uh, what kind of theory you, 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 you wish to talk about. Uh, relativity theory, quantum theory, whatever. Anyway, we, we always select somehow the aspects, so it's easier. Nevertheless, so it seems that we might be more optimistic about using CT in case of epistemic processes. But, on the other hand, if you think about it uh, in more detail, I won't go into details uh, here because I would need uh, much more time, that the, the two processes are in fact entangled. Which is, if you, if you look at it, they're superimposed somehow. There is nothing like an epistemic process that is completely separated from a poetic process. They are usually and practically always entangled. So, so in fact, somehow, when you consider the, uh, any kind of epistemic process, then you enter, to, in fact, uh, to the problems that are inherent in the poetic processes. Not all of them, but still. Especially, uh, it comes, uh, I think it becomes clear when we consider that some forms of knowledge may be considered as artifact. Not all kinds of knowledge, but clearly some kinds of, uh, uh, as uh, considered as artifacts. If they are artifacts, of course, then they're the result of poetic processes. So, so that the, pre, the, uh, the question is, in what sense and how can CT be applied to help deal with multi-aspect and multi-language or multi-theory involved in epistemic and poetic processes? This is the open question uh, I pose, and we can put it in an even more general way, or reformulate it. In what sense and how can CT help, I don't know what is the 88 here, to diminish the unavoidable and irremovable imperfectness of real-world poetic and epistemic processes, uh, which results from the multi-aspect and multi-language issue I, I, I told about, the limited uh, applicability of formal methods which I talked about, and the miracles of transformation between objects of different ontological categories. Which I think that uh, especially the last point is incredibly interesting <laughs> from the philo philosophical considerations, which mm, if we realize that what, really can, what we can do with formal methods that, in, with that increase our uh, trust in what we, uh, what we produce in case of knowledge of what any kind of artifacts. But then, anyway, there is uh, no hope, in fact, I believe, there was some hope in computer science or in computer technology that we can avoid this kind of problem of transforming one kind of software, for example, to something that really works. But that, that's a, uh, that, uh, that is very superficial and you can easily prove that it's not the case. There is no uh, series of transformation that, ca that can lead from some kind of descriptions to the real thing in the real world. It never happens. What, whatever case you... I sometimes uh, <laughs> joke somewhat that if uh, somebody, somebody believed that God was a designer and designed the, uh, our, the world we live in, then she probably had the same, uh, the same kind of problems, uh, transforming his thought or words into the real thing, and that's probably why we are imperfect. So I leave you with the big question, how can we try to use category theory in these new contexts, and I hope, I think there are quite a, a lot of interesting questions here, different probably from the questions you have uh, talked about here in the context of uh, physics or mathematics. Uh, it's uh, probably new issues that could uh, give us new light or new thoughts about category th uh, theory itself, but I'm not sure. And that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.